Howdy, folks. Today we're talking compressing time with the undisputed lord of the time lapse himself, right after this. <laughs> Welcome to Camera Shake, where we bring you the insider scoop on all things photography and videography, giving you a unique opportunity to stay ahead of the curve. As always, I'm your host, Kirsten Nuts, and before we get into it, I've got one thing to ask of you. I've noticed that over 65% of our viewers on YouTube and listeners on audio are not actually subscribed to this channel. But you can help us out by hitting that subscribe button. It'll help us get even more amazing guests on the show, although I'm not sure if that's even possible, but yeah, might as well give it a shot. It's just one click. It'll take a mere second. Thank you so much. Now, without further ado, let's give it up for today's special guest, the time-lapse photographer, creative YouTuber, and educator, and as far as I can tell, the first Belgian we've had on the show ever. Give it up for Mr. Matthew van der Put. Matthew, man, how's things? Things are good. Thanks for the intro. Nice to be here. Uh, Belgian-Australian since a few years ago. But yeah, this, I don't think there's a lot of I don't know many Belgian Australians or Belgians. I was going to say actually um, doing a lot of creative stuff, so it's nice. It's nice to be there. Yeah, I don't know many Belgians. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's very small country. country. A lot of people. It's nice when someone asks me like, "Where are you from?" I'm like, "I'm Belgium," and they're like, "Oh, from Flanders? What's it called?" Whatever. I'm like, "Wow, you know enough of the country to know that we're split in multiple parts," and it's always a very contentious. Uh, topic of conversation with fellow Belgians, but um, yeah, small country. Uh, I lived there my whole life until I was 23, and then I moved to Australia because I met a girl that I love, quit my job, uh, moved over there. That was 10, 11 years ago almost, and we got married three months ago, so things have gone oh, well. Oh, <laughs> wow. And now you're you're in London, is that right? And now we're in London, yeah. So I, I loved Australia. I loved living in Sydney. My career was going really well over there, doing all things time-lapse and hyperlapse. Um, but then my then girlfriend was like, I want to live in London for two years. She said at the time, um, that was five years ago. So we've been here actually coming up to six years. So yeah, time's flying. Obviously we lost a little stretch of time there with everything locked down, but, um, making up for lost time now. And yeah, London's fun. Living in Europe's great. If you like traveling, you can do the old city trip here and there. I visit my family in Amsterdam and in Belgium quite a lot. So yeah, it's good stuff. Amazing. Now, time-lapse photography, that's a super interesting subject. Um, some of the listeners and viewers on this channel will probably know that I recently I made a little time-lapse um, instructional video for PlanetPod. And as I was doing that, I came across your work and it really absolutely floored me. Because, you know, as, I mean, as somebody who's, like, I guess like a lot of photographers, you know, as somebody who has dabbled with time-lapses but never really got into the nitty-gritty of it, I saw your work and, it, like I said, it was Amazing, absolutely incredible. So give us a helicopter view of how you first got into making time lapses. Firstly, thanks for the kind words. Much appreciated. Um, I've been doing time lapse photography or I've been creating time lapses for, I, I think, since 2010 or 11, uh, something like that. I was in film school at the time. And the, the, the thing that triggered it for me, because... After a few years, I analyzed, like, where did this actually start? And I realized that it started before the moment that I'm about to describe to you. But the moment that really, like, brought it home was watching a film on Vimeo when I was still watching stuff on there before the company took a bit of a turn. It was called The Island by, I assume he's Scandinavian, Terje Sørjert or something like that. I don't know how to pronounce his name. But it was a video of the one of the Canary Islands. And it was your, you know... M beautiful your standard beautiful like mind-blowing time-lapse video with astrophotography the milky way inverted uh cloud formations fog rolling against mountains everything sped up i was watching this and honestly jaw hit the floor I didn't know what i was looking at um because i found it it was just visually so so impressive the saturation the the, the elements the stuff in the sky sunset sunrises all these things and i'm like and i knew how to make videos and i knew how to shoot photos but i'd never been conscious of the technique of time-lapse photography where you use a photo camera and high resolution raw photographs to create super high quality video files uh, so i always call myself a bit of a hybrid shooter because you know my input is photography my output is video um that video triggered it for me. I, I Googled, well, I went through the comments and the description of that video trying to find out 
what is this? What is it shot on? How does this work? What do I need? Can I do that? And at the time, I had a Canon 600D with just your stock firmware that I was Googling, had to time-lapse with that camera. I landed on Magic Lantern, which I assume a lot of your listeners are familiar with, or maybe not, depends on how young or old they are. Um, a custom firmware that you can load on the SD card of select Canon cameras, and it enabled you to shoot time lapses without a remote. Shot my first time lapse that night on the Nifty Fifty, the the fifty mil one point eight. It was a, uh, a a sky shot because I started shooting it at night, and I just got immediately immediately hooked. I haven't stopped shooting since. I've since turned it into. It's gone from a hobby to an obsession to a career that has taken me all over the world and has allowed me to work for you name it, whichever big brand I've maybe possibly probably worked for them, uh, visited many countries and continents and shot for many cities. Uh, and it's still a hobby. I still enjoy shooting it as a hobby. I have, uh, that my view here in London is a incredible view of the skyline. And if the sky is nice or if the clouds are interesting, you'll catch me on my balcony with one or two or three cameras still shooting stuff, not to share it per se, just because I like doing it. And I like seeing what the sky looks like when you speed it up. And I like seeing what everything looks like when you speed it up, which is what time-lapse photography is, you know, capturing stuff and then making it move faster. <laughs> and the incredible thing about that is it really revealed something about the world that we, that sort of, it, it remains hidden from the, from your bare eyes, you know, normally that's the interesting thing. I, I, I look at it as a as a looking glass in a a sort of a different dimension. Looking at the technique, it just it gives us visibility on on our environment from a different perspective. How clouds move, how cloud systems or, or storm systems or or air interacts with different air flows, different humidity levels in the sky. You can have a, a storm front hitting a city and having an updraft from buildings that affecting how the clouds move. But if you shoot people on a crossing, looking at Shibuya crossing or uh, people coming out of a station, if you if you shoot that with the right settings and and the right shutter speeds and interval, you can see how organic everything moves and how it's all fluid. Everything's a fluid pretty much, and that's the fascinating thing. It's this looking glass. We can't see it. We can't witness it with our own eyes. So we use technology and, and hardware and software to reveal these things. And, you know, other stuff is how the color in the sky changes, how different layers of clouds get lit up with different colors from different frequencies that get absorbed differently through the atmosphere at different times of the sunset and the sunrise. All these things, we don't, we don't, we don't know that it's there. But when you shoot a time lapse, you, you, get to, you get a glimpse in this hidden world. It's, it's super interesting. Uh, I remember doing some uh, very simple time lapses um, off the, the River Thames and all the boat traffic that's happening on there. And I was watching it back afterwards. I'm thinking, huh, I didn't realize boats turn like that. <laughs> yeah, they're just... kind of like drifting and it's fun. And then you see how, yeah, there's different currents and stuff in the river. It's it's funny. And this has come through my career as well. Like when I started doing time lapse as a hobby, what we were talking about earlier, I told myself, and it's, just, it's weird that it's coming up now because I remembered this um earlier this week i'd kind of forgotten it for a few years i remember when i started doing time lapse as a hobby and got really really obsessive with it i've got a bit of an obsessive personality i remember saying to my family like or you know and, and friends i i don't think i can turn this into a career or into paid enough paid work because looking at how much time and energy and money you spend on getting to a location setting up a couple thousand pound worth of gear waiting there for a few hours, then going home, then offloading it on expensive hardware to edit with expensive software, all this work, hours and hours of days and days, and then you end up with a 10-second video, like who in their right mind is going to pay for that? I remember saying this, um, but I managed to do it. When I moved to Australia, I decided to give it a red-hot crack and found the right people with the right vision and the right budgets, and that led to a very fulfilling career. It's just, yeah, you got to you got to find the right people to make it into a career, I guess. And I'm guessing you didn't necessarily start out with like, you know, tens of thousands of pounds worth of camera gear. Like, how did you first get started um, in terms of gear? Did you just use like your regular Canon Ravel or something? Of that yeah, sort? it was the, um, I think it's the Rebel XTI for the American audience. It was a 600D in Europe or in Belgium at the time. 
Started with that, had a couple of lenses, bought a secondhand L lens, my first red ring, you know, very exciting. A secondhand uh, 17 to 40 F4, the, I want to say Mark II version, or maybe the Mark I, I forget. It was pretty, it was pretty old, but it allowed me to um, shoot wider. No, I'm, yeah, that was my first L lens, but the lens that came before that was a crop sensor lens, because the 600D, of course, is an APS-C sensor. It was a Takina 11 to 16 2.8, which when I eventually upgraded to a 5D camera, 5D Mark III, you could still use that 11 to 16, even though it's an APS-C lens from 16 to 14 mil, you get a small amount of vignetting, but you still had that wide angle um, available that covered the sensor. And I think after that, I got the 17 to 40 F4 because I wanted sharper images then I slowly started expanding uh, to another 5D3. I think at this time I was living in Australia and got to know through Abraham Joff, who was one of my first, um, uh, one of the first directors, I guess, to to take me under his wing to shoot stuff. He had a great relationship with Canon Australia. I got to know those people. They got me some jobs. They got me some work. Some of the jobs I got paid in gear. So eventually I ended up having another 5D3, another 5D3, then a bunch of 6D. 60 Mark IIs, I think. I just expanded, like, I kept on expanding. 24-105, great all-round lens. 7200s, f2.8, uh, ISUSM Mark II. Very great lens. Great memories with that one. And then just, yeah, I kept expanding to the point that I, I just had so much kit. <laughs> I still have a lot of kit, but I've downsized a lot since. Um, but, yeah, just slowly, slowly snowballed into a large amount of equipment when i was living there my filming well my office which is the equivalent of this but it was a different setup back then had a wall with all these shelves behind me and i had all of my kit just spread out on it all the boxes little little trinkets but lenses cameras i used that as a storage instead of a trolley like i have behind me now or other shelves or boxes i just had it all on there it was a wall of gear and a lot of my viewers from the early days, which still I remember how that uh, was and how ridiculous it was to have so much gear. But I didn't use I didn't use the majority of it because when I went when I was doing a lot of my time lapse and then eventually hyperlapse work, uh, I made the most of it. I'd be shooting you know three four cameras at the same time, flying a drone on the side, doing some Snapchats when we were still Snapchatting and all that. So, yeah. Because you're also running a, a YouTube channel at the same time. That's that's the other thing. So you're gonna you have to create content for that. Continue. Yeah, I've got I've, yeah, I've got a love hate relationship with YouTube. I've been on YouTube since two thousand and seven. Uh, that's the age of my channel. So the the issue with that is that the channel is so old that a lot of my followers, which currently is sitting up around seventy two k subs, I think, a lot of those people are from different timelines or from different times in my YouTube career, if you can call it that. Some of them started following me because I was doing travel vlogs. Some of it was random cinematic with quotes um videos some was silly stuff some was eventually so you know becoming time lapse and tutorials and then editing tutorials and but all those different um subjects had a different following and i now i've got this this jumble of people and i think when i post a new video i think this is what's happening because my views are generally quite low because i believe when i post a video it gets spread out to or seeded out to a number of people that are spread out over all those interests. If two thirds of them are no longer interested in time lapse or a tutorial and they don't engage, it's not going to help the algorithm to push it out to more people. So, I've played with the idea of starting a new channel a lot, but I, I just I don't think I can be bothered. And I've got yeah, I've had the channel for so long. I've been uploading on it for so long. I've got everything nice and set there. It's a really hard thing to walk away from. Um, so I just keep trying. And my latest thing now is to do YouTube Shorts, which I posted a video yesterday, got a decent amount of views. Then I like, let's do it again today. And then it just absolutely bombed. So I don't know. I keep uh, <laughs> I keep trying pretty much. It sounds like a very recognizable, you know, situation. But uh, it's it's the same thing, really. You know, um, this this podcast goes out on YouTube as well as, of course, across virtually all YouTube audio channels, if you want, uh, or audio platforms. Um, and YouTube really isn't necessarily, it's not a native home for podcasts of of this length, you know, an hour, hour and a half plus or whatever. Um, and so, you know, it's a very similar thing. Like the, the way that 
this podcast performs on YouTube is in no way comparable to the way it performs on audio. And so I've been thinking about, you know, uh, you know what, what am I going to do with the YouTube channel? Am I going to like add um, instructional videos, for example, or, you know, stuff like that or gear related stuff or whatever. And I had exactly just, I followed the same sort of path of thinking as, as yourself. Where I was thinking like, oh, maybe I should set up a new channel and just start mm -hmm. over and like focus it on that. And so right now I've just come back to the realization that actually screw it. I'm just going to, this is the home. So, you know, I sort of carry <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know. Also just like from a, from an, a practical point of view, I have a lot of links out on the internet, stuff that will link back to my channel, subscribe links, all that kind of stuff from the last, you know, 15 years or more. Uh, I don't know how to redirect, fi firstly find all those and then redirect all those. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it is, it is the home of me. I think I'll just keep trying shorts and maybe eventually I'll break through, uh, the algorithm, but also I, I find it, I find it a, often a bit pointless to, to worry about algorithms because I see this on Instagram a lot and then people on TikTok and people just complain about the algorithm constantly. And I don't know, just, you know, make stuff that you like doing. If you're lucky, people will find it. If you're lucky, you have an audience that will keep looking for it. Uh, but just yeah, don't don't write too many angry tweets or threads about how, exactly. how the algorithm's doing your disservice. There's yeah, no, yeah. there's literally no point. Like, what's going to happen? The the algorithm's going to read your tweet and going to change. <laughs> uh, and also, you know, ultimately, you know, when you when you're putting the work in into making, you know, a video, like your videos are really interesting. You know, and obviously you put a lot of work into them. You know, and the same thing is true for like making a podcast episode or whatever. You know, there's time and effort and so on that that needs to go into it. If you don't really like doing that, it's not, you're not really going to, I mean, if you're only just chasing the views or the subscribers, mm. then I think in the long term, we're talking yeah. years rather than mm. rather than weeks or months. There's no longevity there. That's another realization I've had. I, I, did, I took a little break at the start of the year or the end of last year. Obviously, you went to Australia, got married. That took up, you know, a lot of time and effort. And it took me a while to get back into it. I always use the start of the year to kind of look and work on my business as opposed to in my business, see what uh, what my goals are, what I'm going to be working on, et cetera. Um, and then I was like, oh, it's time. It's really time. I really should make another YouTube video. And then I sit myself down and I start, start working on it and I post it. And as soon as I sat down, even though it took me so long to sit down again, as soon as I sat down and I finished it and I uploaded, I'm like, oh, I really love this. <laughs> I really love this process of making making videos, not necessarily for YouTube, but I do have a soft spot for it because it's always been the ultimate social media platform for me, even though for a long time, and maybe even today still, people don't really see it as social media, even though it is maybe the most of social media because you really get these parasocial relationships with <laughs> other creators. But um, yeah, it's I just, I just love it. And I don't think I'll ever quit. And that's the thing. If you don't love it, you won't have that longevity. You won't be able to do it for a very long time. That's something that reflects in that as well is I'm, I've been thinking of the idea of restarting a podcast or starting a new one. I started one years and years and years ago, um, po filmed a few episodes, posted one, and I was like, ah, whatever, moving on. Because at the time I, I was trying too hard. And now the idea of me restarting or starting a fresh one, I had this whole idea and this concept of like, no, you, you won't be able to keep going with that. What If you're doing, if you're going to do a podcast, it needs to be the way that you are. And it would be me with my mate who just sit down and take it easy and chat about all things photography and careers in photography and how to make money and all that kind of stuff from a creative career. But it has to be us because otherwise you won't be able to keep going for 199 or 200 episodes like you've so incredibly have done. Which is so impressive, by the way. Oh, thank you. I mean, the thing is, it really is, you know, I love doing it. That's ultimately what it is. You know, I started it with a friend and then um, after about, roughly about, I'd say just over 100 episodes or something, you know, when everything came back to normal or went back to normal, um, you know, then um, I think he felt that he had to go back into, you know, work a full time and it became, you know, it, it became a difficult workload. And I, at, the, at the time I thought, I love doing this. I'm not going to stop. You know, it's, I love having these conversations. And the interesting thing was only uh, earlier today, I got a, uh, I got tagged in a story on um, on Instagram uh, with somebody who's obviously been listening to the podcast and um, and then sent me a message and I and she said, um, oh, you know, I love the podcast. I learned so much. And I thought, well, that's why I'm doing it. And actually, that's really why I'm doing it, not only for the audience, but also because I learn a lot. Like I learn a lot from 
talking to you about time lapses, right? Or talking to Joe McNally about lighting or whatever. Like I have learned so much as a photographer, no. not only as a photographer, also as a human being, actually, you know, yeah, um, yeah. that I think that I, you know, I wouldn't be where I am now just in terms of, in terms of skills, you know, if it hadn't been for this podcast. So I always call it my own personal university, you know, it's much better than any university course because I can talk to anybody and ask any question I want. It's brilliant. It's a really, it's just a really big win-win that you're describing here because you're getting something out of it. You're, you've obviously got a very great situation, like um, operation going on here with how easy it is and how the, the layout and everything. So it's easy for the guests. The guests get the exposure from your audience. Your audience gets the knowledge or the intel or the whatever the value from the guest. It's just a value increase for everyone involved. And, and that's the, that's the lovely thing. That's a very nice thing to, to be able to do. If you can monetize that properly and have that going either full-time or on the side, that's just, yeah, it's great. It's yeah. very inspirational. Exactly. And the monetization thing, you know, is something that that has sort of started to happen over time, but it really wasn't like, it yeah. completely was not a motivator in the beginning. In the beginning, the motivator was literally, you know, so we were talking before we went on air, the motivator was literally just not going insane during the lockdown. <laughs> I was about to say that. Probably like just trying not to go absolutely crazy. Yeah. To be honest, I did the same thing, except I, I did my Cloud Palace live streams on Fridays, Friday afternoons, because I'm a very social guy. I like going out. I like, you know, living in London. I like going to the pub or living in the UK. I guess that's the thing you do, right? Except sadly, it's gotten so expensive lately. But I couldn't do that anymore when everything was shut down. So I would just buy all these like niche beers and taste them on stream on YouTube while reviewing the clouds of the week. So I had, obviously I've got the view and I would have cameras set up all week long just to capture the clouds and then I would render them. And then on the stream on Fridays, Friday afternoon slash evenings, we would, um, we would just stream and have fun and talk, talk shit in the, with the, in, with the chat and the comments. And I'd try and plan all these things, like do a stream from the balcony and have my phone linked. I was still on Android at the time. So I was using all these obscure apps to sign into my OBS remotely. And then one time, cause my new what, that you can't see here, it looks down to the BT Tower, uh, which is a big telecommunications uh, tower. And two days of the year, the sun sets right in the middle through that tower. So I I planned it all out <laughs> to be able to capture that on the stream, uh, which was very fun. And then it was cloudy. Uh, but then I did it again the next day because I'd misjudged the timing as well. So that was um, that was that that came from that. W there was no monetization plan there. If anything, it was probably really bad for my channel. Because people subscribe that aren't really interested in me keep seeing these live streams pop up every Friday. I'm like, who's this idiot? What's all this about? I don't care about that. Unsubscribe. What it did do is strengthen the bond with my community, with the people that were, you know, just hanging out. 20 to 50 people every Friday just watching this guy geek out over the sky and clouds and how how it's all liquid or fluid dynamics happening right above our, our heads that we're not aware of. Uh, but yeah, yeah, there was no monetization there. There's a lot of stuff that that was going on during the lockdown. Like I remember starting a, a Zoom, like an open Zoom thing, where I was teaching different aspects of Photoshop, for example. And I just thought, oh. like, you know, I've got fun doing this. You know, if other people can can join in and learn the thing or two, then fantastic. You know, let's do it. But really, it just gave me an opportunity to hang out with a bunch of people and drink a lot of beer whilst I was doing it. So you know, my editing skills were sort oh, of getting better. a little hazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there, there's some some live streams where I'm like four beers in, I'm like, oh. I've got to eat. I'm getting pretty loopy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just call it, like, all right, guys, I'm off. I don't want to be drunk on stream. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, remember, I remember looking at the screen one time and going, like, did I apply blur to that or is that? <laughs> that that's just my eyes going. <laughs> that was funny. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, what's about... that, that open, uh, the open group was that like just to join any any time the Zoom was it on Zoom? Yet? Yeah, it was in Zoom, like when right, everything was in Zoom basically at the time. You know, it was basically I just I just put out a time and a day. I think it was a I think it was a Wednesday uh, evening sort of a thing, seven PM or whatever. And I just put it out on social and you know, whoever wanted to join in, I put the the Zoom link on there and whoever wanted to uh, you know, join in and learn some Photoshop or whatever, um, then they'd be welcome to just join in, you know, and um and I would just go through a particular project on, on Photoshop, you know, whatever the the topic of the week was. Um, and I would just teach people how to, I don't know, how to replace skies or how to, mm -hmm. uh, color correct things or like 
whatever, how to retouch skin or whatever it may have been. Um, yeah. Every video was just a different thing. And it's it something just... I was also always wanted to do on the live streams, but the issue was I was running an old, an older MacBook at the time, high spec machine, but just wasn't good enough to do it while live streaming with the screen and everything. Plus, the issue with time lapses is you're dealing with thousands of raw files versus one photo in Photoshop that you're applying whatever masks and effects on and drawing on it or whatever um, to quickly demo what you're doing in a time lapse. It's just not a thing because you're editing a thousand photos at the same time. Then you've got to save all the metadata, export it or import it in other software and then render it. And that often takes 10 minutes to an hour. So the, the, the process of that is it's almost like cooking shows where you've got to prepare the renders beforehand and then pretend that you're editing or actually re-edit them all to the point of that and then you have the file that's already been rendered the day before uh, ready for the camera for the live stream. That's maybe yeah. how it could have solved it. Exactly. I mean, for for those viewers watching this now, as this is going live, uh, which, will, which will be a couple of weeks after the photography show, but since we're recording this a few days, almost a week before the photography show, um, I'm... I'll be teaching how to easy edit um, video for podcasts um, on the production and editing stage at Meta Photography Show. So this would have already happened. But basically, so I can mm. reveal my secrets now, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, okay. Um, but yeah, you know, in you know, in order to to edit a whole like two hour podcast episode in thirty minutes, you know, um, that's really not really going to happen live on stage. And plus, there's rendering times and all the rest of it. So what what I've done is um, I've got um, my good friend David Bergman as uh, as agreed to come on and we recorded a five minute you know excerpt of a of a show, uh, including the intro and the outro and a and a little bit of chatting in the middle. But I can then take that five minute example and edit, ed- basically edit it in exactly the same way as I would edit um, a standard episode. But I do it on an iPad because it's all about creating an easy version of it and if i can get this whole episode done whilst i'm sitting on the couch i'm sold hey let me just jump in real quick to tell you about the amazing sponsor of this episode platypod platypod offers innovative camera support systems designed to unleash your creativity with their stable versatile and portable solutions you can capture stunning shots like never before and i'm not just saying that as the host of the Camera Shake podcast, I can personally vouch for Platypod's incredible products. They've become an integral part of the show. In fact, I'm surrounded by various Platypod products holding up lights, cameras, microphones, and so on. It's really helped to transform the way I make the show and the way I shoot at home, in the studio, and on location. But don't just take my word for it. Explore Platypod's website at www.platypod.com to discover their range of products, including the Platypod Extreme, Platyball Tripod Heads, and the brand new handle, of course. Make sure to follow Platypod on Instagram and Facebook at Platypod Tripods for exclusive updates, tips, and giveaways. By choosing Platypod, you're not only investing in your photography, but you're also supporting the Camera Shake Photography Podcast. Thanks again to Platypod, our amazing sponsor. Platypod, where innovation never sleeps. Yeah, that's something I, I'm not sure how to do. Again, it has to be, if I'm doing the podcast soon, it has to be doable to I don't want it I don't want the post production side of things to block me from doing anything like oh I don't want to record because it's gonna take another two hours of editing. So I'll be very interested to um to try and get some knowledge off you, hopefully at the photography show, uh or from some other recording somewhere. To figure out the best uh the best workflow. That's something I always like doing. I recently like redid my whole office and I've got a different lighting setup and my microphone here, etc. And then I can just spend days and days and days just testing and figuring out if anything needs to change or you know, if it's easier, if that clamp is over there or if this little cable hanging thing is over there, it's... Man, workflow is such an important thing. You know, when, when Nick um, decided to leave the, the podcast, it was, you know, before that, when we first started, we had, uh, the way we had it set up is basically that um, I would do the pre-production, you know, do the planning, I would um, get guests on the show and everything else. And then he would do the editing. And then um, and then afterwards, I would do the, the promotional social and so on. So it's pretty, it's pretty much, I think it's it's fifty fifty roughly. But then yeah. of course, uh, when I continued doing it on my own, um, I then had to do everything myself. So now I had to do all everything that I was doing before, plus all the editing and everything, and that very quickly turns into a massive ordeal, you know. 
Um, yeah, and if, so you said because you say slowly on your monetization has come in and has worked, but if you're doing that from the start with no real clear vision of when money's going to come in, that's just such a ball ache. So you really have to love it. You really have to be doing it for because you love it or because you love how the community responds to it, etc. So yeah. yeah, and you know, I mean, for me, it was like you know, at that point, um, I was at a point where. Um, you know, I guess I managed to get some really interesting guests on. And I kind of thought, like, I, you know, I, I've given the opportunity to have these conversations with with those people and and learn from them. I mean, I'll be doing this for free, one hundred percent, definitely. Um, but but it really, it was all about reassessing workflows. There was one one particular moment actually, uh, where um, I was chatting with Frederick Van Johnson, uh, who. Uh, who does the the uh, this week in photo podcast? And we were talking just of offline, you know. And uh, and I was like, I think I was I was recording everything on Zoom at the time. And I was complaining how it would take me about like six hours or something to to all in to edit an episode, right? Gosh, and he was man. like, Yeah, and he was like, I don't know why you do that to yourself. It takes me twenty minutes, and I'm like, How do you do that? <laughs> twenty minutes. Uh, what were the what were the key takeaways? What were the key differences? Oh, the key differences was that he used Ecamm, basically. Oh, uh, okay. And, you know, and the thing was like, so everything uh, that I would do manually afterwards, you know, in post, all the like cutting. Like transitions and stuff. And... Yeah. And like, you know, cutting from one speaker to the other, you know, for instance, if it's like me me speaking, I could cut to myself or, you know, I can yeah. I can put you in a frame or I can basically have both of us um, on the on the screen. You know, that I would do afterwards and so i would have to, i mean it was just like and when you're editing a two-hour episode you know you just yeah. imagine how yeah because you have to, you gotta have everything synced up and yeah now it's yeah and so you know i sort of thought well this isn't this isn't happening but of course when it comes to ecamm for example i'm able to literally live edit it i can just decide when i want to cut and that's it and so my output basically is that that's the video file that's the podcast and i really just have to bookend it put the intro on yeah. put the outro on you know, put some uh, images over the top or whatever. I mean, all that kind of stuff's relatively straightforward. And so, you know, create a template file that has everything sort of pre-made on there. So it just saves me a ton of time. And of course, the other thing was, um, so Nick, who I started the podcast with, was also a, an audio engineer. So he did, he took care of all the audio editing. And when Adobe Podcast came around, when they, you know, they bought Shasta and then, you know, now they're out uh, there, enabling you to do basically audio enhancing via AI. Um, when that first came out, I thought like, I'm going to give that a shot. And I have to say over the last sort of eight months or something, that has to that has really come on amazingly. So my audio workflow is, I'm just going to upload it into there and I'm downloading it again when it's done. And that is it. And just the audio, the audio track, you put that in there, it treats it nicely. You yeah, download so it. Yeah. It yeah, so even for instance, you know, imagine like if if both of our audio levels are slightly out of you know out of whack, uh, it will flatten everything out. It will compress nicely. Um, in the beginning, the compression was really harsh, but they've really diff now. Um, enable you can now basically reduce the amount of processing that you want on it. So you have like a percentage slider, you can slide it back or, you know, where, wherever it sits comfortably. Um, it takes takes care of all the background noise. It takes care of the EQing, um, and everything else. So. Really, all I do is I whack the audio file through that, re-import it, sync it, um, and then apply a limiter uh, setting that I've I've created a preset for that, um, which just brings the audio levels to exactly where I need them. And that is it. And it literally, mm. the beautiful thing about it is whilst that takes a few minutes, you know, f- to happen, I can do other things, you know, and... And actually, so I'm not losing time. I'm not waiting for that to to cook. Essentially, it just does it. Yeah, you you're trying to be as efficient as possible because if you're doing that on a lot of apps, you've got you know a lot of time adds up. That's something I've that. always always focused on. In both from the since it was a hobby to when my time lapse photography became a career, is efficiency. Specifically, because you're working with so many files from multiple cameras over multiple days for whatever project. You know, what's the fastest way? And oftentimes and, it's just getting a faster computer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but also you know, I mean, but this is the software. Thing. Yeah. Talking about time lapses, like, you know, I remember when I 
dabbled with some time lapsing years ago. I mean, you really had to like get in there and do a lot of manual stuff. And of course, now, first of all, your iPhone can create a pretty decent time lapse right out of the, yeah. right out of the gate. Yeah. But what is your sort of post production process like? Once you filmed the time lapse, the time lapse itself, what's your sort of pro, uh, process after the fact? Totally depends on what what is shot, what is shot on, and where it's going. Um, I've had clients, or this week, uh, last week, we I wrapped on a shoot. Um, hopefully, you'll see the results of that on TV in the next few months, which will be fun. Can't talk about it now. But uh, they needed the absolute highest resolution possible with um, everything, like all the data, it, nothing could be compressed. So instead of going from a workflow where you um, reprocess stuff multiple times for hyperlapse, for example, uh, we make sure that you your raw files get turned into the correct video codec and resolution and everything from, from the raw to that file directly so they can put it in their pipeline. Other people I know would do raw to an intermediary or a proxy file to then do another edit and then export it to video. But every time you compress, every time you export files, you lose quality, you lose data. And if your production's of a certain scale or quality, you can't be doing that stuff. Uh, but generally, say I shoot a time lapse, let's talk two scenarios. One is just a daytime shot of the sky, of a cityscape, shot on a DSLR or a mirrorless camera. The other scenario will be where we have a day to night transition, like a sunset or a sunrise, either way. Scenario one, it's daytime, I've got my camera set up, and I'm shooting 300 photos at a fixed interval, say every three seconds, and I'm capturing a raw photo every three seconds via a remote or built-in an intervalometer that triggers it. You end up with 300 photos that are all on the same exposure, because you shot it manually, that's the way you do it, uh, in manual mode. I then load that onto an SSD on a solid state drive or internally on my SSD. Generally, you don't work with spinning drives. That's very slow and, yeah, just <laughs> bogs you down when you're working with big, big sequences. That gets loaded into Lightroom Classic. Again, this is just one example of many potential workflows. So Lightroom Classic, where I import that whole sequence and I color grade one of the photos that then gets synced to the rest of the sequence. And then I save the metadata of that edit. So exposure changes, contrast, uh, vibrant saturation, curves, whatever. All of that gets saved in a so-called side card file and .xmp file next to your CR2, CR3, RW2 files. So your raw files get a little buddy next to them in your Explorer or in your Finder. You need that little side card file because when you then load that sequence into After Effects and set it up so that it exports into a video file. After Effects will read the edit that you've done in Lightroom Classic from that side card file. Otherwise, it will just render out a flat look of the preview that was in the raw file. Or it doesn't render at all because it doesn't know what to read. Uh, depends on your uh, settings, etc. But generally, raw to video, and the video has a built-in color grade already because you've graded it in Lightroom Classic. That is one way you can do an edit. What I often do if I'm shooting, like if I'm on a time crunch, I'll shoot RAW and JPEG. And if it's not needed, that it's the highest possible quality, I'll have the RAW file stored somewhere, but I'll just export the JPEGs using an app called Glue Motion, which is a free and a paid version. It's just a really simple interface. It's really efficient. It's really quick to just quickly render out some sequences. You don't always have to open up After Effects and wait for it to load, etc., and use a complicated interface. So... That's the, the basic time lapse where the light stays the same. If you have a time lapse where the sun is setting, obviously your light's changing. You need to adjust your exposure. Otherwise, you're going to get really dark photos if you're starting daytime going into full night. Depending on if you have a smart camera, and with smart camera, I mean it'll gradually change the settings as you're shooting, as you're capturing the light. It knows that it has to ramp the settings slowly over time, not from one photo to the next so that it's all flickery. If you have a smart camera... You don't have to do too much editing. You can follow the same workflow that I just described. If you don't have a smart camera or an older camera, you have to manually adjust your exposure throughout that sequence. So you end up with a little zigzag pattern as the sun sets in your brightness value of those photos, of that photo sequence. You can remove that or you can level out that brightness zigzag with a software called LR Timelapse. And I just mentioned 
you can level out L and ramp ramp your settings. That's what it stands for now, level and ramp time-lapse, LR time-lapse. It used to be called Lightroom time-lapse because it was a side software to Lightroom, but I think there was a trademark issue there, obviously, in the name. It is incredibly powerful software, and I've used it for almost since the start that it came out. What you can do with LR time-lapse is you can deflicker your footage, which is another big issue with time-lapses. If you sh if you started out with time-lapse at one point in your life, you probably landed on an issue where your footage is very flickery. The brightness goes up and down per frame. That's because cameras generally aren't made for time-lapse. And if you have an aperture, if you're shooting at f11, every time the photo clicks, the aperture closes, but it doesn't close hyper-accurately. It doesn't close exactly the same. So there's micro-fluctuations in your aperture blades between photos. If you're shooting a series of portraits where your model is moving positions, etc., you won't see that brightness change. But if you're shooting the exact same frame under the exact same conditions, two seconds apart or three seconds apart, you will notice that micro fluctuation in the amount of light that hits the sensor. So that is the brightness flickering that you can remove with LR time lapse. You can remove that zigzag brightness from your curve. You can change your white balance from daytime to nighttime throughout the shot. So like sequentially, it spreads out the change. You can adjust your crop. You can do all, all these exciting things in LR time lapse, like long term. Uh, time-lapse capture editing as well and it works now with the new version it works by itself or it works alongside uh, Lightroom Classic so it's yeah the beginner stuff you can go with free or free apps or some cameras render in camera then you can go Lightroom Classic and After Effects and then there's LR time-lapse and After Effects that being said DaVinci Resolve has a version I've made quite a lot of videos about all these softwares that you'll find on my channels. But with DaVinci Resolve, you can do everything for free now as well. There are just certain limitations and it depends on the camera brand that you have, depends on the raw file that you have, etc. All of this I've talked about on multiple tutorials and written blog posts and videos and in my time-lapse course as well. You'll find all that. But yeah, there's, it's like, you know, how long is a piece of string? Or you can ask like, what's the best way to shoot a model? It depends on the situation, what you're after. Exactly. And of course, you know, uh, there, there will be, for those for those listeners uh, who are interested, all the links will be in the description, obviously, uh, so you can check out um, Matthew's uh, YouTube channel uh, with, like I said, there's a plethora of super awesome videos on that that really go into absolute detail uh, with any anything time-lapse related. Um, a lot of cameras, now there's a lot of, like, relatively uh, recent cameras have time-lapse settings uh, built in. Is that something you'd recommend if somebody wants to like get started uh, with time lapse? Is that is that useful? Yeah, definitely check out what the camera has built in. Um, I think Sony calls it, or maybe Nikon calls it intervalometer. Lumix calls it time lapse. I'm on the Lumix system now. Half the reason for that is because it's the built-in time lapse features are incredible. Time lapse and stop motion, and for hyperlapse photography as well, it has these features that are so incredibly useful. That really shows how much the brand thinks about what do, pro what do professionals need and also what do beginners need to shoot time lapses. But yeah, check out the menus or just Google, you know, camera brands, time lapse, how to. If it's Canon or Lumix, you'll probably end up on my website or on my YouTube channel. I haven't made too much content about the other ones. But the majority of cameras have something built in now. If they don't have that built in feature, go on um, wherever you are, Amazon, B&H or Best Buy and just put in your camera name and intervalometer or time-lapse remote and you're likely going to find a remote that's around between 15 to 25 USD or euros that will allow you to trigger a photo every one to 60 seconds, something like that. And you can use that to get started. That's how I started after I moved on from Magic Lantern with other cameras. Um, those remotes are so affordable, they're very reliable and you they open up, you know, a whole world of fun of shooting time lapses. And Nikon, if you are a Nikon shooter, um, Nikon do this thing where um, you, know, you can set your intervalometer, but also there's time lapse function where it then takes those images and it bakes them into a video file. So just for the super, for, you know, for the sake of super simplicity, you can then yeah. just basically create it. Yeah, video I've got some tutorials on the Lumix channel. Where it's and Nikon does it and Lumix as well. You can choose like the playback speed, the as no, sorry, the um, the resolution the frame rate, uh, all from the raw files that are in the camera. That's something I wish Canon did. And I've asked them this years and years ago, please add this functionality because this is the beauty. You can 
shoot RAWs and JPEGs at the same time, have the camera render a 4K 50 frame video file in camera so that you can pre quickly preview what you've shot, show it to a client or whatever, or use it as proxies for an editor. You, you just don't have that on Canon. Uh, and that's part of the reason why I moved to the Lumix system because it does have that. And Nikon, uh, Nikon's getting some good PR lately. I think it's, was it this week or last week, depending on when you're listening, um, probably a while ago, that they bought they bought out Red. Um, I think all of a sudden Nikon's going from the not so cool as far as image goes. I don't really look at it that way, but uh, they've they've changed their image a lot. I think. Oh yeah, I mean just uh, they've making that transition from underdog to dog. Yeah. I think. <laughs> well, yeah, underdog in the sense of like all the cool street shooters. Like if you look at people that are always like hyping up Sony and that, even though they really don't like Sony, but they somehow managed to capture that youthful, um, you know, urban city shooter, travel, vlogger, cinematography, whatever. Uh, and then there was Canon because they had the good colors. And then the underdogs like a Fuji or a Lumix, Nikon was like on the same level as them as far as sales go, I think, and quality of product and what professional is used, but they've never really broken through to that younger crowd, I find. I mean, the amount of memes that are out there about how Nikon is weird, <laughs> it's silly. Just to clarify, I'm still brand agnostic. I used to be a big Canon guy, but then I found out, you know, where I realized if I'm going to be making content for a whole audience that is about time-lapse photography, I can't just limit myself to one brand. So I started making content about more camera brands. That being said, Lumix just stands out for me as far as the, the hardware and the software. But you can shoot great time-lapses on any camera. Right, Matthew, I know you have to shoot. It was amazing to have you on the show. I'm sure uh, we're going we're to continue that conversation, especially because uh, there's so much to talk about when it comes to time-lapses but also hyperlapses, which isn't really something we've sort of dived into um, in this episode, but we will do in the in the future. Um, and I, seeing that you're not actually that far from me, you're in West London, is that right? East London. Uh, East London, okay. So shortage, East. shortage area, just out of shortage. Uh, other side of town for me, but still not yeah. that far. So I'm sure, you know, a pass will cross in town at some point. Yes, um, definitely. So, Go shoot and grab one of them beers we were talking about earlier. Oh, 100%. Definitely. Again, Matthew, uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Amazing. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Excited to uh, check it out and check some other episodes. Okay, folks, that's it for today. I've been looking forward to having Matthew on the show for a while now. So it's been awesome to finally make it happen. Um, and as always, before we go, let me just recommend another episode that I think you'll like. Check out episode 187 with Russell Preston Brown, where we discuss the future of photography. I'm sure you'll love it. If you enjoy our content, consider supporting us on buymeacoffee.com forward slash camera shake to help us continue creating and bringing you more exciting episodes. And I have no idea why I keep saying us because it's really just me. So there you go. It really does mean the world to me. And for those of you who are listening to the audio version of this podcast, did you know that there is a fully fledged video version over on YouTube with plenty of examples for our guest photography in full Technicolor? All you have to do is go over to YouTube, search for Camera Shake Podcast, and you'll be able to watch all past episodes on there. If you're already on YouTube, drop us a comment, hit the like button, ring that bell, and share with your friends. Your engagement helps us reach a wider audience all over the world. Thank you for listening and watching, and remember, new episode drops every Thursday, so make sure you mark that in your diary, calendar, whatever you use. Until next time, keep shaking things up in the world of photography. See you next Thursday. Bye.